Rousseau and the Metaphysical Implications of Calculus by John Robert Beck. Henri Bergson's philosophy is centered on forming a concept of living time, or durée, which he saw as a process of continuous variation and flux. He believed that the study of time should be the foundation of philosophy. By studying time, we find an integration of concrete, infinite, qualitative multiplicity within consciousness that we should use to understand the essence of reality. I show that his insights into the reality of duration come directly from a metaphysical or phenomenological interpretation of integral and differential calculus. Drawing on the newly published lectures from 1902 to 1905, I show how an introduction to metaphysics schematizes his method in matter and memory and time and free will. The concepts of calculus are not merely metaphors for Bergson, they reveal certain metaphysical implications which problematize the way we understand movement, life, consciousness, time, and reality. Bergson used the terms of calculus, integral, fluxion, differential, derivative, convergence, passage to the limit, to explain his views of life, consciousness, and the proper method of philosophy. He outlined this approach in his long 1903 article titled An Introduction to Metaphysics, published in the Review of Metaphysics and Morals. He also greatly expanded on these ideas in his recently published lectures at the Collège de France between 1902 and 1905. I stitched these texts together showing that Bergson released metaphysical implications from calculus by approaching it on an empirical basis through a careful observation of consciousness and time claiming that the scope of calculus insights far exceed their role in mathematics. Bergson claimed that the implications of the basic concepts of calculus are metaphysical and spiritual. They reveal something like phenomenological or transcendental structures of our consciousness of time. Bergson's metaphysical interpretation of calculus was in the background throughout the whole of the 1902 and 3 course at the Collège de France which dealt with the history of the idea of time from ancient Greece up to Kant. Calculus comes to the forefront in several of the lectures, including the 16th, in which he recounts the history of the evolution of the idea of infinity and the metaphysical insights that calculus affords. Here, Bergson parallels but expands on what he wrote in an introduction to metaphysics, where he likens his me philosophical method to acts of integration and differentiation. Looking at these themes in his classes between 1902 and 5, and comparing them to his use of calculus as a metaphor throughout his corpus, I show how fundamental this theme was to Bergson's whole way of doing philosophy. While this topic has been slowly making its way into recent scholarship, its full significance has not been entirely seen. I show that his interpretation of calculus, or rather, we should say, the metaphysical implication of calculus underpin Bergson's theory of knowledge, his proto-phenomenology, and his theory of life. I'll begin by overviewing the basic concepts of calculus and then move on to look at Bergson's treatment of the intellectual history surrounding calculus, especially Zeno, Leibniz, and Newton. I end by looking at how these themes feed into Bergson's own method for metaphysics. Basic concepts of differential and integral calculus. Before looking at Bergson's account of the history of metaphysics, I'll quickly define the relevant concepts from calculus and trace their importance for Bergson. Integral, meaning entire, complete, and represented by a curve. A simple unity enveloping an infinite number of parts. Integration is a way of mathematically describing a continuous change by gathering an infinity of unique differentials. The integral is the simple way of articulating an infinity of differences, also referred to as the generating axis or intention. Differential or fluxion, meaning an infinitely small amount of change. It is a theoretical entity in one sense, but a fundamental reality of nature and consciousness in another sense. A differential or fluxion cut out from the integral is an abstraction from real continuity, just as an infinitely small amount of time is always enveloped by a larger duration. In a curve, each differential flows into the rest and forms an integral unity. 
derivative, represented by the tangents, which touch the curve at a single point and generalize the instantaneous directionality of the curving movement into a linear movement. The integral is not truly an infinity of tangents any more than a circle is a polygon with an infinite number of infinitely small lines. While derivative and differential are treated mathematically equivalent by the operation of integration, they are not metaphysically equivalent according to Bergson. Continuity passage to the limit and convergence refer to an indefinite series arriving at a final term or of a continuum arriving at a final element or an infinite multiplicity forming a unity. It is the paradoxical and almost magical aspect of calculus. The mind carries out what would be an unlimited number of discrete accomplishments, converting an infinite number of derivatives into an integral sum. Summing up, an infinite number of infinitely small uh, variables, dividing something infinitely divisible into its smallest division. Continuity is ultimately what connects an infinite multiplicity of differentials to an integral unity of a curve. Continuity, passage, and convergence have correlates in experience, real becoming and duration, giving calculus an empirical verification that has metaphysical rather than mathematical implications. Together, these concepts form the basis of our understanding of calculus and informed Bergson's metaphysics. Imagine a curve in the process of being drawn, something like the feeling of turning a car on the highway. Every moment, our trajectory changes. Not only are we changing by moving, like moving in a straight line, but we are also changing our orientation. Now we can also switch our perspective between a constantly changing orientation, directionality, etc., and an intention which envelops all these changes of orientation, the simplicity of a curve as a unity. The parts, differentials, of a curve all agree and interpenetrate in an indivisible continuity. In this little thought experience experiment, we move from the differential to the integral, and catch a glimpse of real continuity. Bergson treats integration, fluxion, and passage as what is most concrete in experience. Consciousness of time is the structure of fundamental reality. In lived duration, there is an immediate relation between integral and differential. They are moment, moments of a single whole, woven together by a passage to the limit. Between differential and derivative, there is a relation of imitation and thus a contrast of the real and the abstract. But between integral and derivative, there is no imitation nor similarity. The derivative is a wholly decontextualized and merely symbolic representation, devoid of insight into the former integral reality. The life of infinitesimals and integrals. In his lecture on April 3, 1903, Bergson characterized the historical evolution in metaphysics leading up to his own terms of two ways of contemplating the infinitely small. Readers of Bergson will be familiar with the importance of this little phrase, two ways, as well as two tendencies, which come up somewhat frequently in his books under different guises and which traces a fundamental contrast in his philosophy between abstraction and concrete reality. The first of the two ways of treating the infinitely small is superficial, formed by negation, and remains external to reality and ends with an abstract representation of empty space. The second is positive, an interior power that is generative of quantity, movement, and order, which he calls intention or intensity and is synonymous with tendency. The first is purely mathematical and involves a contradiction. This contradiction, according to Bergson, made the ancient Greeks, to the exclusion of Archimedes and Antiphon, reject the insights of infinitesimal, infinite, and integral. The contradiction is simple. An infinitesimal or infinitely small part of space is a contradiction because space can always be further divided. And so no smallest part can exist. 
This purely mathematical infinitesimal is an artifice of calculation, and one which up until the Renaissance, science and mathematics was treated, like Archimedes had said, as only a last resort, and was considered not only imprecise but scandalously contradictory in its basic outlook. In this lesson, as in Time and Free Will, Bergson wanted to show that the reality of flux is primary and that the reality on which the abstraction of mathematics, mathematical quantification depends. Our lived experience involves continuity, a convergence of infinitesimal fluxions or differentials, also called passage to the limit. The integration of continuous multiplicity and consciousness mirrors but is more primary than the integration of infinity and calculus. A continuous integration of multiplicity is given immediately in the intuition of our own duration and is presupposed in all life and thought. It is from our lived intention or intensity, which involves a psychological reality, that quantity, space, and concepts are secondarily derived and on which their relevance to us always depends. There is an empirical basis of calculus, the transcendental structure of integration in perception, memory, and consciousness. The artifice of calculation in the first way, according to Bergson, depends on the ingenuity or the genius of the mathematician, an activity of the mind which unfolds in a concatenation of moments. Calculus is possible because of the spiritual energy of consciousness that integrates the multiplicity of its experiences into something coherent. The first way of treating the infinitesimal makes it something sterile while the other is fertile. These infinitely small bits end up as mere derivatives that cannot, on their own, make up the integral reality. In exactly the same way, movement cannot be made out of points in space, nor can life be reduced to chemical reactions. Both movement and life imply something in addition to their present physical condition, velocity, momentum, acceleration, impetus, tendency, intensity, intention. Reality involves a virtual and potential existence in addition to the actual. This is the first major metaphysical implication of calculus. It opens a metaphysics of dynamism, virtuality, and vitality. The second way of treating the infinitely small is fertile, since it implies a, quote, positive notion and a reality, end quote, so much so that, quote, the infinitely small fluctuations are what make up Duray itself, but as an infinitely small intention, an intensity, because Duray is mobile intention and intention is intuition, end quote. There is something simple in the intention of the movement that generates a curve. The tangent has an altogether different intention, and a curving intention cannot be made up of an infinity of divergent intentions moving in an infinity of straight lines. By the second sense of infinitesimal, positive fluxions continuously generating difference, live duration unfolds into multiplicity while maintaining a continuous indivisible unity, what he elsewhere calls continuous or qualitative multiplicity and intensity. Time is an infinite bubbling up of novelty in an indivisible passage and consciousness is the compound unity formed from this bubbling multiplicity of flexions in integrals of experience. Metaphysical origins of integral calculus. Questions related to the metaphysical implications of calculus have had a long but generally underappreciated history. In fact, key components of calculus had already been developed in ancient Egypt, Greece, China, and India. Zeno and Aristotle having only scratched at the surface, while Archimedes took it furthest in mathematical rigor. In the bubbling fermentation tank of Italian Renaissance mathematics, foundational debates took place over the nature and possibility of infinitesimals, which had implicit ties to spiritual and metaphysical commitments. Bonaventure Cavalieri and the indivisibilists asserted that lines are made of points, planes are made of lines, solids of planes, called the method of indivisibles, and received strong
strong backlash from several Jesuit mathematicians. This problem later played a massive role in French intellectual history, following Nicolas Malebranche's effort to usher in an infinitesimalist revolution. These discussions were not without their ties to history, and in particular to late medieval metaphysics, especially questions related to the nature of infinity, motion, intensity, and continuity. Bishop Berkeley famously lampooned infinitesimals as, quote, evanescent increments and the ghosts of departed quantities in his book, The Analyst. Emily de Châtelet played an influential role in shaping this debate and translated Newton into French. Aspects of the phenomenological interpretation of calculus shaped her ethical writings, especially tendency, tension, and virtuality. Solomon Maimon later used calculus to critique Immanuel Kant's treatment of metaphysics. The presence of a metaphysical and psychological interpretation of calculus appears across the French spiritualist tradition from Pierre Mandeberon's uh, decomposition, uh, memoir on the decomposition of thought and Felix Ravisson's On Habit and Lachillet's uh, fundament, uh, Foundations of Induction. The psychological and phenomenological aspects of calculus were essential to Leibniz's monadology, which had a profound impact on Bergson's thinking via the French spiritualist just mentioned. Maimon claims that Leibniz first stumbled upon, upon the problems of the infinitely small and integral individuality in philosophical and metaphysical questions, motivating his mathematical insights. Maimon claimed that these concepts in fact belonged to philosophy and were taken from there over into mathematics, as well as that the great Leibniz came to discover came to the discovery of differential calculus through his system of the monadology. Whatever was the true series of events in Leibniz's life that led him to his discoveries in either mathematics or metaphysics, it's certain that he encountered the need to posit a principle of real concrete individuality as we see in ourselves and in animals, which cannot merely be composed piecemeal by discrete units or atoms. This way of existing he calls substance, or better, monads. From this requirement he formed a profound notion of continuity on the model of a psychological, a psychic activity called entelechy. The active entelechy of a monad is conceived under the model of the intentionality and intelligence which guides the movement of a curve, a unity that contains an infinite diversity of details in an indivisible whole, whose existence at any instance in time is a momentum and tendency rather than something extended or a static quantity. This brings with it a metaphysics of the virtual. The soul is a virtual whole, not a totality unfolding and enveloping an infinite multiplicity of moments of life. In the same way, a formula contains an infinite number of parts, which we can analyze after the curve has come into being. A moment in the shifting and mobile intentionality of our inner life has an instantaneous velocity or acceleration, a dynamism, that is a contradiction if considered statically and abstractly as a point. It involves a way of existing that exceeds present actuality, totality, finite quantification. This is a fundamental insight, the philosophical or metaphysical interpretation of the infinitesimal, that Leibniz used analogically to structure his mathematical and metaphysical systems. Central to the monadology is Leibniz's rejection of atomism, not merely as a theory of physics, but as a general intellectual tendency. It involves an insufficient way of thinking. He tells us in the third section of his new system how after freeing himself from the bondage of Aristotle, he accepted the void and atoms, though these abstract concepts merely satisfied his young imagination. And later, on further reflection, he found them wholly unsatisfactory to the standards of thought itself. 
The reason, he said, was that aggregates have no intrinsic principle of unity. The soul is the ultimate source of unity and individuality and is an evident fact that atomism fails to account for. Atomism will never be capable of providing any principle of continuity or individuation. Leibniz returned to Aristotle to retrieve a certain conception of substance as an original activity or primitive force, dynamically conceived as enveloping an infinity of predicates which interpenetrate in a continuum. This provided him with not merely an alternative theory to atomism, but rather with an altogether different mode of thinking via continuity, activity, and potentiality. This metaphysics will come to be reinterpreted and developed further by Bergson via tendency, along, and virtuality. And teleki becomes the integral reality of living movement, experience, intentionality, and perspective, which, like a curve, is a complete inner unity generating and holding together an infinite number of infinitely small fluctuations, perceptions, and details. The entelechy of a person is the unique concrete unity of their life history and their aspirations and their whole integral persona. All of the events of their life, including an infinity of details and a unique whole, a monad, that is their past life and its condensation into the person who acts and reacts with their own particular style. Thus, a monad as a unique entelechy is the principle which produces the continuity of an infinite multiplicity. This is more or less what I call the phenomenological interpretation of calculus relating to intentionality, the experience of continuity, and the role of integration in perception and consciousness. It has certain metaphysical implications as well as we will see Bergson profoundly reimagine, improve, and sharpen the precision of these phenomenological descriptions. These are the humble beginnings to the great mathematical contribution Leibniz would make by inventing a notation for integral calculus. This is a remarkable fact of intellectual history, especially given the relative lack of literature and conversation around the topic. This implies a dynamic metaphysics with its reliance on a notion of continuity, which involves coexistence of infinitesimal flux and integral unity. The evidence for this coexistence is to be found in immediate experience. Metaphysical Implications of Fluxion While Leibniz was more fundamental in respect to the integral pole of experience, Newton better described the differential side, which shows, according to Bergson, how the insight of calculus is truly metaphysical in its scope, since it called the fundamental aspects of our lived experience into question. It is my belief, in fact, that the idea of differential, or rather, fluxion, was suggested to science by a vision of this kind, i.e. an intuition of duration and vitality. Metaphysics in its origins, metaphysical in its origins, it became scientific as it grew more rigorous, that is, expressible in static terms. In short, pure change, real duration, is a thing spiritual or impregnated with spirituality. Intuition is what attains the spirit. Duration, pure change. Its real domain being the spirit. It would seek to grasp in things, even material things, their participation in spirituality. It is Isaac Newton who, according to Bergson, brought out the most metaphysical aspect of calculus by bringing into question our ability to think about the reality of movement and calls us to focus on becoming. Newton goes further than his predecessors. He is a true inventor and in that he shows the advantage to be drawn from invention. We can say that Newton also goes further than them in the metaphysical sense and that he shows us better than his predecessors what we could call the metaphysical point of view of calculus. Then, quoting the Orpuscula, Bergson concludes, quote, the mathematical times themselves are generated by the flux. Thus, there is something that is deeper than mathematical time. It is the flux. This is what we call duration. These are real generations. 
Berkstone also credits Newton with differentiating a derivative vision from a primitive vision. Bergson here differentiates himself from Newton, saying what Newton would call derivative is what we call primitive, and what he would call primitive is the derivative. The derivative vision being in reality that which engenders the other. This amounts to saying that if we place ourselves today from a purely metaphysical point of view, we place ourselves at a point of view which is the reverse of the invention of calculus. From this point of view, the invention is naturally much less rigorous, but it is the point of view of duration that must be considered. Newton followed the same tendency of mathematics and science, rather than embarking on the metaphysics he made possible. But he also made explicit the power of genius and invention, which are at the heart of all metaphysics, an invention of integral concepts. By following this thread of historical development, Bergson shows how his understanding of qualitative multiplicity, intensity, and duration were new inventions born of the metaphysical interpretation of integral and differential calculus. This metaphysics becomes more concrete than Bergson's discussion of Zeno of Leo.